<laughs> Welcome everyone. You are at She Jumps Nutrition 101, an introduction to holistic wellness with experience momentum. We are all about getting healthy in every aspect of our lives when it comes to everything we do in the outdoors. She Jumps is based around outdoor play that transforms and every part of that involves being healthy nutrition wise, mentally, all of the aspects that make you adventurous and healthy to pursue those adventures. So She Jumps, if you don't know, we're all about increasing the participation of women and girls in outdoor activities. We partner with nature to create safe educational outdoor experiences for girls and women that nurture growth and transformation. Tonight's presentation, Nutrition 101, is all about getting that holistic roundness wellness together in your life and figuring out how all those elements really fit in. We've got registered dietitian Nicole here to share everything she knows and more. We will be having questions at the end. So go ahead and as you're watching the presentation, enter your question in the Q&A section and we'll make sure to get to it at the very end. Nicole, I'll let you take it from here. All righty. Thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here virtually with all of you. Um, giving you guys all just the basics and then diving a little bit deeper into certain topics. Um, I hope everybody walks away informed, excited, and with some practical tips on how you guys can fuel for whatever activities it is that you are doing. So a little bit of an overview. I'm going to start off with kind of diving into our philosophy around nutrition and experience momentum and kind of shedding light on what food is really about. We will get into some science. So we're going to talk about the macronutrients and talk about metabolism in our body. Um, I'll provide some guidance on making balanced meals and snacks and what that looks like. We'll talk about nutrition for outdoor activities, whether that's summer, winter, spring, fall, whatever it is. I'm going to give you guys some tips. And then close with our focus on holistically. How can we really take all of this that we've learned and carry it into our life? Um, and then at the end, I'm going to provide some information on what we do at Experience Momentum. So beginning with what food is really all about, and this is a really, really fun topic. Um, and I'd love to shed a little bit of light on some of the background. So really, what does the diet industry tell us? This is a big question that we get a lot, and we'll spend just a few brief moments on this. Um, many of you guys might be on Instagram or reading the news and may be kind of getting the idea that health um, equals a certain body type or that um, health means certain um, looks certain ways. And really what we're learning more and more about is that health is different for everybody. Um, the diet industry is something that me as a dietitian, some people might think, oh, like, isn't that you? Are you part of that industry? Absolutely not. So I, and we experience momentum, kind of try to do the opposite. Um, so there's a lot of fear around foods, around different body shapes and sizes. Um, and in kind of mainstream diet culture, not a lot of um, celebration of different shapes and sizes, different cultural foods or practices. Um, and so we at Experience Momentum really like to encourage the opposite of that. We love to celebrate all bodies, all shapes and sizes, and all cultures, and love to help our clients learn how whatever foods are important to you, those foods can fit into a healthy diet. Um, so really, it's kind of about a perspective change, ultimately. And it's about focusing back on food as a source of nourishment, as a source of community, and ultimately as a source of pleasure. Because at the end of the day, food really is meant to taste good. Okay, just gonna do one thing here. I love this slide because it serves as a really nice visual reminder of how a lot of us live our lives, right? And how a lot of us can fall into the trap of being really preoccupied with food. Because to be honest, it is kind of confusing. There's a lot of misinformation out there around what is healthful, how much of certain things should we be eating, and it can lend itself to, if we can kind of chart out what's going on in our head in a pie chart, looking like this. Um, and so what I love to do is help people um, live a life that looks more like this. So this kind of bottom pie chart that we have here. So if we're living in a world where we're super preoccupied with food with our body, um, it doesn't really leave a lot of room for other things. It doesn't leave a lot of room for adventure or for travel, um, being outdoors and really enjoying it and being in the moment. 
Um, and so I'm really all about how can we really kind of quiet the noise um, and provide really practical information that you can all use with the hope that everybody's kind of mental pie chart looks a little bit like that one on the bottom right there. So with that said, I'm gonna dive into the macronutrients. So you guys may be familiar with these. They are protein, carbohydrates, fats, and water. It's kind of a forgotten macronutrient. There's a lot of misinformation out there um, around which ones are bad, which ones are good, should we be avoiding fat, should we not? And so my goal is to kind of shed some light on this and give you guys a new point of view on this and come at it from a scientific approach. So as a dietitian, very, very evidence-based. It's my job to constantly be updating myself on what's out there from a research perspective. That's really how I inform my practice. Um, and so everything that you see here is based in research and based in science. Starting off with my favorite, which are carbohydrates. Big spoiler alert here is carbs are not the bad guy. Big, big one there. So big fun thing I like to debunk. Carbs get a really bad reputation and there's a lot of confusion around them. Um, we have the low carb trends like back in the 80s and 90s and now we have keto. Um, when in reality, carbs are actually our body's preferred energy source in the form of glucose. Um, and why is that? It's because they're easily digestible and they're a very, very rapid energy source. So some of you might have experienced this. Maybe, you know, you're feeling a little groggy in the morning. Maybe you have some coffee that perks you up. Maybe you don't and you have a nice piece of toast or you make yourself some pancakes or you have some fruit. You're going to have energy pretty quickly. And we're going to dive into the, what this looks like later on in the presentation and talk more specifically about blood sugar balance. Um, but ultimately, it's important to know that carbs are our preferred source of energy. Under normal circumstances, glucose is really the only source of energy that's used by the brain. Um, and it's the main source of energy that's used by our liver and by our muscle. Another fun thing about carbs is that we can store them. So when we eat things like in this photo, we've got bananas, we've got apples and potatoes, our body's going to break them down into glucose. And then we're going to use some of that glucose to fuel activity. Maybe it's skiing or hiking. Um, <clears throat> whatever you don't use, your body's going to store as glycogen. So all of you sitting out there, we all have nice little storages of uh, carbohydrates. I like to think of them as fuel tanks in your muscles and in your liver to serve you when you need them. I also always encourage variety. So while we know that a diet rich in carbohydrates is really critical to maintaining and kind of um, performing in life, uh, we want to include all carbs. So simple and complex carbs, what are those? We're going to break those down in the next slide. So simple carbs, think of these as rapidly digesting, commonly known as kind of sugar. So white bread, fork drink, juices, those types of things we think of as simple carbs. Complex carbs are much more slowly, slowly digesting um, and they're commonly called starches. Um, and they're called complex for the simple reason that their molecules are just more structurally complex when you look at them in a microscope. Um, so these are things like sweet potato, whole grains, so things like brown rice and then vegetables, fruits are all fantastic sources of starch for complex carbs. Super important though, to understand that simple does not equal bad and complex does not always equal good. So they have different uses for different situations. And I love to illustrate this with an apple, an applesauce and apple juice. So if you are hungry for a midday snack, maybe you know you just finished a work meeting or maybe you're in the middle of school and you're in a snack break and you want something that's gonna kind of provide you with energy, um, that's going to be a little bit longer lasting energy, an apple might be a really good choice because the fiber in that apple is going to help your body kind of effectively use those sugars or the carbohydrates. If you're getting ready to head out for a run or, you know, you're going to take your bike out for a cycle or you're getting ready to go out for a hike and you didn't get a chance to have breakfast, um, applesauce might actually be the better choice because it's more simple. So the fiber in that applesauce has been cooked down. Um, it's going to be really easy for your body to digest and absorb that and for you to use it. So if you have like 30 minutes or less before you're heading out, you want to think along the lines of more simple parts. If you're playing a sport, so you're in the middle of a soccer game, or your kid is in the middle of a soccer game, or you're in the middle of a hike, 
um, something that's actually really, really simple, like apple juice, is going to give you the biggest bump of energy and the most readily usable energy. The other fun fact about carbs is we can actually absorb them in our mouth. Um, so that's why liquid carbohydrates or those goos or gels that some of you guys might be familiar with, those work really well because you start the absorption in your mouth. Um, more complex things like starches, so the kind of carbohydrates we find in this apple here, we can't really absorb that as well in our mouth. So that's an example or three examples of different types of carbohydrates, same food, apple, but different forms and how we can kind of use them in life. Moving on to fat. So fat is a super, super critical nutrient. Well, we're here, eating fat is very, very good for us and we actually need it. Uh, it provides adequate energy to fuel our activity. And we're gonna kind of talk about that a little bit later in the presentation and break down exactly what you're using at different activities and different types of intensity. But just know that fat's really important to give you adequate energy to fuel any activity. It's kind of the opposite of carbs though. So where carbs are really quickly digesting and they provide you with kind of rapid energy, fat is very slowly dig digesting and it's gonna give you really nice, long lasting energy. So if you've ever had like just a straight piece of toast with maybe a little bit of butter, um, and then maybe the next morning you have a piece of toast with an avocado, you're probably gonna be more full or longer from that piece of toast with avocado because it's got that fat in there. Fats can supply us with what are called essential fatty acids. These are very critical for hormone function, for brain function, and for our immune system. And we also require fat to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. So you may be wondering, well, what are those? Vitamins A, E, D, and K. Um, these are all fat-soluble vitamins, and they actually require fat for us to absorb them. So for those of you out there that might be taking a vitamin D supplement, and really anybody living in the Seattle area should be, because we're not getting enough sun, um, and we'll dive into why later. But for any of you guys taking any vitamin D or really any supplement that has vitamins A, E, or K, it's really important that you are consuming them with something that has fats and really help you absorb those. A little more about that right there. And I also should have said before I got started that I will be uh, distributing the PDF version of these slides and some handouts as well. So you don't have to try and remember all of this. Um, you'll have the PDF versions of all of these slides with the information on there. Fat's also really important for hormone health and balance. Um, so our endocrine system, which is the system that supports our hormones, is very, very key and it relates many, many processes uh, or regulates many, many processes. Um, without adequate fat, we can't actually have those systems function. So we really, really need fat in our diet to do that. And last but not least, fat promotes satisfaction and fullness, which is also known as satiety, right? Translates as it has good flavor. Nobody can argue that, you know, um, pasta with butter tastes fantastic compared to just pasta on its own. So those are some of the key functions of fat and really important reasons to include them in your diet. We get a lot of questions as dietitians. Especially recently, there's always new research. I feel like every month there's a new study that comes out, saturated fat's good, saturated fat's bad, don't eat butter, you should eat butter. It's a very confusing world to live in. Um, so here are just the straight facts and a summary of the research that we know as of today. Um, we've got saturated fat and we've got unsaturated fat. Saturated fat I think of as an in-between fat. And what I mean by that is that the research around it is kind of mixed. So there's not enough research to date to say that saturated fat contributes to heart disease. Um, our body actually does rely on a variety of different types of fat to do everything it needs to do. Our most recent evidence suggests that there might be a benefit to swapping out saturated fat for unsaturated. So what that means is there may be a benefit to having more olive oil, or if you're somebody that loves butter, you'd be subbing some of that butter in for oil. But what we know is that completely eliminating fat altogether and opting only for low fat things actually does not confer as much of a health benefit as we once thought. Um, so that all goes to say the research is a little bit out. The jury's kind of out on whether or not saturated fat is um, completely bad, but we do know that it does have some benefits. 
Uh, one of those is it's a source of cholesterol. So cholesterol is key. It's really, really important for the synthesis of hormones. It's also really important to help your body make enough um, digestive juices, or specifically bile, that helps you digest things. Without cholesterol, we couldn't really do that. Um, saturated fat, <coughs> excuse me, is also a really important energy source, kind of all fats are. Uh, here are some sources. So really, it's going to be anything that's solid at room temperature is going to be called a saturated fat. Anything liquid at room temperature is unsaturated. So things like butter, full-fat dairy, eggs, animal protein, and coconut oil are all sources of saturated. Interesting fact about coconut oil. Coconut oil is a source of MCTs. I'm sure if I could like see everybody's faces and have everybody raise hands, some of you may be familiar with MCT oil. It stands for medium chain triglyceride. And it's interesting because we can actually process absorb and use it much faster than any other type of fat. So that's why if you're heading out for an outdoor adventure, or you're heading out for a run or a ski trip or anything like that, recipes that use coconut oil can actually be really beneficial because you're, you're able to use that fat during that activity um, more efficiently than if you were using, let's say, butter or yogurt. So it's not to say that butter or yogurt is bad, it's just to say that specifically for activities, MCT oil can actually really um, give us energy much more rapidly than other forms of fat can. And you can purchase MCT oil just um, as is. They sell it at many stores. Um, I will say that it's oftentimes in just its pure form, it can produce a laxative effect, which may not be fun, may not be what you want to experience during a sport. So I usually tell people stick with coconut oil, um, and keep the MCT oil for situations where you're not going to be um, not near a bathroom. And we'll kind of leave it at that. Moving on to unsaturated fat. So this is going to be fats that are liquid at room temperature. Um, so things like oils are kind of our primary source. You'll note that there's avocado and nuts and seeds there. So those are obviously solid. Um, but they're a combination. So they're a combination of saturated and unsaturated. They just tend to have a little bit more unsaturated. Monounsaturated, often also known as MUFAs, are a fantastic source of vitamin E. Vitamin E we're gonna talk about later, but it's a really, really powerful antioxidant to help your body fight against inflammation. It's fantastic for cardiovascular health, and helping stabilize your insulin and your blood sugar, and you've got your sources right there. And then we have polyunsaturated. So these are known to actually help your body produce more good cholesterol, which is HDL, and therefore help your body decrease the bad cholesterol, which is LDL. Uh, polyunsaturated fats, you guys probably know these as omega-3s or fish oil. So that's a really good example of this type of fat. They've got great anti-inflammatory properties. Along with all the other fats, they do provide support to our hormones, um, but these types of fats seem to provide the most work. And some fantastic sources are fish, um, nuts, and seeds. So moving on to the second to last macronutrient, protein. So while carbohydrates and fats play a really important role for energy, so they're going to give you really good energy, especially during um, before, during, or after a workout, protein plays less of a role in actually producing energy in your body and more of a role in helping your body repair and build tissue. So you guys may be familiar with amino acids, and I think we've all heard the term from grade school, amino acids are the building blocks of life. Um, they really are. So they're the building blocks of muscle, of bone, of skin, of cartilage, and of blood. Um, and without them, we would definitely not be able to function. Really the biggest function I, th I, I think of, or most of us probably think of when we think of protein is building muscle and repairing muscle. Um, so you ask anyone out there on those lines, oh, protein helps you build muscle. That's very, very true, but it's also important for other things. So I love to think about what are the reasons we need it beyond building muscle. These are some key ones. So uh, protein is very, very important to help us build hormones. Um, and hormones are actually proteins themselves. And these hormones help regulate our sleep, our mood, and our energy levels. Proteins are also really important to help our body build enzymes. And what enzymes are going to do is help you to digest and absorb the food that you're eating. Um, they help with other things. They help us process <coughs> chemicals and medications. 
but they play a really strong role in helping you digest things like lactose or things like fiber or things like protein itself. So we actually need protein in order to digest protein, which is kind of funny if you think of it like that. And perhaps the biggest, most important thing on everybody's mind this day is our immune health, right? Um, proteins are the our bodies to make antibodies. Antibodies are the, they themselves are actually proteins that help our body fight against infection. They've been all over, right? Everybody's been talking about antibodies these past two years. Um, so really important to know that you've got to have enough protein for your body to be able to build hormones, to have proper enzyme function, and for your immune system to function well. Proteins also really key in helping us balance our blood sugar and then helping us sustain energy. So while protein itself maybe doesn't give you a ton of energy, it helps you effectively use the energy that you get when you eat foods like carbohydrates and fats. And we'll, we'll talk about that in more practical examples in a few slides here. Um, the other thing that I like to kind of talk about here is protein quality. I get a lot of questions from plant-based athletes or people that follow plant-based diets in general around what do I need to do from an amino acid perspective? So with proteins, we've got essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are amino acids that we have to consume from our diet because our body cannot make them. Non-essential amino acids are those that our body can actually make. So we don't really have to worry about eating a lot of them. The funny thing is though, in order for our body to make those non-essential amino acids, we have the essential ones. Um, and this is where plant-based diets come into play. So by far the richest sources of essential amino acids are animal foods. So things like dairy and eggs and meats. Um, and then plant-based sources of those essential amino acids are gonna be things like quinoa, soy products, as well as spirulina. Um, and so for those of you that may live a plant-based lifestyle, it's really important that you are consuming adequate amounts of those foods. So quinoa, soy products, spirulina, um, in order for you to make all the proteins your body needs to make. So in kind of summary, if we don't have enough of these essential kind of amino acids, our body can't really do all of those things under that function list. Another huge question I get from everybody, how much protein do I need? You guys might all be sitting there yourselves and wondering, well, how much do I need? The average person needs about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Anybody that's more active, um, so think if you're either taking more prep classes or you're a runner or you're a skier in the winter, um, a rock climber in the summer, you're going to need more protein than that. Um, and if you have questions around that, happy to answer those at the end. But in general, start with that at a very minimum 0.8 grams per kilogram. And just for reference, for you guys wondering, well, why is this in kilograms? 2.2 um, kilograms equals one pound. So you can just take your body weight in pounds, divide it by 2.2, and then multiply it by 0.8, and that'll give you the amount that you need. Is there such a thing of protein overkill? Yes, there is. So with protein, more is good, but more is not always better. I typically encourage people to focus on the having adequate balance of protein, carbohydrates, and fat, and we'll kind of get to that in a second here. And I also encourage people to focus on the quality and the timing of protein. So really there's kind of a range to aim for in meals, about 20 to 40 grams in a meal, um, with 30 grams being kind of what we call the sweet spot in one single meal. When we consume more than that, <clears throat> so if we're eating, you know, maybe taking a protein shake and having a four egg omelet and having, you know, bacon and sausage, that's a lot of protein. And that's likely more than we can use in one sitting. It doesn't mean don't do that. It just means that essentially um, we are either going to be storing the extra protein in our body as fat, or our body has to go through kind of extreme processes to excrete that extra protein. So it's better to kind of give the liver, give the kidneys um, a little bit of a rest and think about that 20 to 40 ish grams being a sweet spot for the amount of protein to consume. And again, a lot of you might be wondering, like, well, what is 20 grams of protein? What's 40 grams? Uh, I've got some handouts at the end that will clear that up. Uh, but for reference, like your average size of chicken that you get at a restaurant, typically about 20 or 30 grams. Typically one egg is about eight grams. So you can kind of get an idea there. 
Um, the other thing that can happen when we consume too much protein in one sitting is we remember that protein is, is pretty slowly absorbing, slowly digesting. And that means that if we have too much, it's going to delay our stomach emptying. Um, and we kind of uh, call this a protein backlog. Um, and it can kind of result in some unpleasant GI disturbances. So people can get more constipated, have more bloating, if we're just consuming way too much protein in one sitting. So official kind of way to think about this, spread your protein throughout the day. So thinking about having some about every three to four hours, rather than trying to squeeze it all in one or, or two meals. Water. This is the forgotten macronutrient, but it is so critical. Um, it may be obvious to some, but I like to kind of break down why we need it. Well, some quick numbers. About 60% of our total body weight is water, and 75% of our muscles are water. So we're kind of like walking bags of water moving around here. Um, and a nice way to illustrate its kind of importance is if we think about a raisin versus a grape. So picture your muscles as raisins, right? Not happy muscles. They're not gonna function well. They're not gonna perform the way you want them to. They might be at a higher risk of injury because they're just not well hydrated. On the flip side, picture your muscles as grapes, right? They want a nice fun grape, right? That can move really well. Um, they can adapt and it's much, there's much less risk of injury or damage to that tissue. So we always want to think of our muscles being more plump and more full, and we do that by having adequate water. How much you might be asking? There are so many different opinions on this. From a research perspective, what we know right now is that about half your body weight in fluid ounces of water is what we want to start for. Um, and then you want to add about 20 ounces for every hour of activity. Now, for those of you that maybe are in winter sports, you're avid in winter sports, right? And you're exercising in the extreme cold. So skiing, snowboarding, um, cross-country skiing, or for those of you that love to exercise in the heat, maybe you're down in Southern California or Arizona and you're always kind of out hiking um, in very hot conditions, you're both gonna wanna bump up the amount of water you drink. So for those of us that are in the heat, right, we all know we sweat. So we're sweating out water, which means we gotta take more water in. For those of us that are out in the cold, maybe, you know, running or again, skiing, um, cross country skiing, you really wanna be sure that you are consuming more water because you're actually going to expire more water in your breath. So that answers how much water per day, about half your body weight in ounces, and then about 20 ounces for every hour of activity. Water has so many functions. So as I said, it's obviously going to kind of lubricate our body. It helps regulate our body temperature. And what's really key is it helps to lubricate your joints. So again, going back to this raisin versus green analogy, we want our joints to be really well lubricated because that means they're going to function better, you're going to have less pain, and you're going to get more use out of them for longer. So drinking water really helps to provide that protective fluid that's going to help you to optimize your performance and mean that you have nice, healthy joints for a long, long time. When we exercise and we're dehydrated, um, not only can that kind of damage our muscles, but it can lead us to be more likely to damage our joints. So super important if any of you guys out there are struggling with any sort of joint issues or you frequently get muscle tears, um, something might be as simple as bumping up your water could help. The other thing is that dehydration, obviously we, we all know that it doesn't make us feel good, right? It, com it compromises our joint function, our muscle function, and it increases our time to recover. So <laughs> you may know that when we exercise, our, our body produces some toxins as a byproduct of that exercise. How do we get those toxins out of the body? We flush them out with water. So if you find yourself um, really having a long time to recover, you're feeling super sore for longer than usual, check in with your water bottle and make sure that you're getting enough. A nice way to know, and what I love to do, is put um, some rubber bands or scrunchies around your water bottle. Um, and you would want to have the number of rubber bands or scrunchies equal the number of water bottles you're going to have in a day. And then every time you finish your water bottle, you give it to the plumber. And then it's really easy to track where you're at. It's so easy for us to forget when we're going about our day. So I like to use that scrunchie method. Electrolytes are also super important. We can't forget about those. Um, and you're not going to get electrolytes if you just drink plain water. 
So this is why it's super key to be replenishing um, with things like sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. So typically I say, after exercise, you wanna rehydrate with much more than just plain water. Chocolate milk is actually a great one. It has a good amount of sodium, potassium, and magnesium in it. Um, you can do water with a meal. So water with peanut butter and jelly sandwich or water with a banana peanut butter. All of those things are gonna give you really nice electrolytes to help replenish what you lost. If you're curious about calculating your sweat rate, um, you, when, I, when I give you guys these handouts, you'll be able to click on this link. It's the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, and they provide an online calculator where you can um, basically figure out how much sweat or an estimation of how much sweat you're losing. And then that helps to tell you whether or not you need 20 ounces every hour. If you're somebody that sweats heavily, you might need that. So moving on, fruits and vegetables are not exactly macronutrients, but they are a source of carbohydrates and they are rich in fiber. A diet that is high in fiber is really good for our digestive system. So fiber acts kind of like brush. And as our fiber seeds that we're eating travel through our intestines, they kind of brush off the walls of your intestines, um, which has been shown to decrease risk of things like colon cancer. Um, a diet high in fiber is also very, very good for blood sugar and for your microbiome. So microbiome is another hot topic I'd love to go on and on about. Um, we all have bacteria living in our digestive system, and they really feed off of fiber or kind of components of fiber. So the more fiber, the better. Um, and that means that your microbiome is going to be healthy and happy and serve you really well. Fruits and vegetables also provide a wide variety of vitamins and minerals. So again, we've got our fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, you need fat to absorb those. So for those of you that love to have salads or you love to munch on raw veggies, fantastic. Those are great things. Be sure to have a little bit of fat with them. So some hummus, some ranch dressing, or if you're doing a salad dressing, have a, or if you're doing a salad, have some salad dressing with it. Water-soluble vitamins. These are going to be the B vitamins and vitamin C. These are really gonna help you to extract the energy that you are getting from food. And vitamin C plays a really, really strong role in your immune system. Um, just for note, vitamin A plays a big role in your immune system as well, as well as eye health and cognitive function. Vitamin E has a strong role in your immune system and in cognitive function. Vitamin D plays a role in bone health. Most of us know that. And then vitamin K, this one's easy, K, think clotting. Vitamin K is gonna help your blood clotting. We've also got our minerals, so things like sodium, potassium, magnesium. Those play really critical roles in our cardiovascular function um, and in functional illness. So the last kind of piece here of the fruit and vegetables are what I call phytonutrients or what we call phytonutrients. They're known as plant chemicals. So they're not exactly vitamins and minerals, um, but they have antioxidant function, meaning they help your body kind of fight against all the damage we take on just living. Why do we need them? Well, as humans, right, we're taking on what we call oxidative damage from things like air pollution, um, from things like sun exposure, and even from exercise. So exercise does induce inflammation in the body. It's not a bad thing, right? Exercise is, we all know it's good for us. Um, and inflammation is how our body heals. The important thing is to be sure that we are matching the amount of inflammation we're taking on from our environment or from our activities with a lot of anti-inflammatory nutrients. And that's what these antioxidants do. They've got a lot of health benefits. They're also very difficult to study. So the interesting thing about them, and this is an example right here, all of these colors that you see in this picture, so the orange you see in those carrots, the red that's in the tomatoes, um, and then the purple that you find in things like berries or pomegranate or red onions, those pigments themselves, so the orange, the red, and the purple, those are actually nutrients. So purple um, typically comes from anthocyanins. And these are found again in things like berries, pomegranates, um, red wine is another source. They're very beneficial for our heart health, for our cognitive function, and they're anti-inflammatory. Beta carotene, some of you might be familiar with this. Um, it's gonna give that kind of orange pigment to many different fruits and vegetables. So to things like cantaloupe, peppers, carrots, um, that's super critical for our lung health, for our skin health, and for our brain function. 
And then curcumin. Curcumin is what gives turmeric that orange, or excuse me, that yellow color. Um, it's anti-inflammatory and also known to be anti-carcinogenic. Fun fact about curcumin is it is much more readily absorbed and used when you have some black pepper with it. So for those of you that like to cook with curcumin or turmeric um, is really what you'd be cooking with. You always want to um, squeeze a little bit of black pepper on there. Or if you're using uh, turmeric in a smoothie, this sounds really weird, but just one little twist of your pepper into your smoothie. Typically, if you're putting some fruits and vegetables in there, um, especially fruits, you're not going to notice the flavor at all. Um, and it's going to help your body to really actually absorb and use that uh, curcumin that you find in the turmeric. Okay, I do, don't know age groups out here, but I know I might have some young adults. No, I might have some parents of young adults. So I wanted to throw some information about young adult and teen nutrition in here. As all of us probably remember, because we all went through it, um, when you're growing, you've got increased energy demands, right? So you've got to eat more to meet those needs because your body is growing, it's developing, everything is changing. So typically, what we recommend as a starting point is aiming to have three meals and about two or three snacks a day. And it's important for those meals to contain all the macronutrients we just talked about, protein, carbs, fat, and water. Um, and then your snacks, typically we say aim to have two or three. So some carbs and protein, like a peanut butter sandwich or banana with peanut butter. Uh, those are some examples. Or a yogurt with granola, that would be pairing those together. However, increased activity means you have higher energy demands. So for those of you that might be um, super active teenagers, or if your kids are super active teenagers, they're going to need more, uh, more food. So two to three snacks might not be enough for them. Some really important nutrient, nutrients for strong bone growth and overall just growth in general are going to be calcium and vitamin D. And then iron is important for development overall. So calcium, you see here in this photo, some great sources are things like almonds, um, dried fruit, grains, and then dark leafy greens, um, vitamin D. We can't find it in some foods, so salmon with the bones is a source, um, dairy products are a source, and then sun-dried mushrooms are a source. However, it's really hard to get enough. The best source of vitamin D is actually our bodies and the sun. So we produce vitamin D in our skin, and then in order for it to be activated, or we have to be exposed to a certain level of UV. Uh, we have to get a certain level of UV exposure. Sadly, for those of you that live up here in the Pacific Northwest, um, or really anywhere that's not like Southern California, um, most of us are not getting enough sun, especially this time of year. So our best bet to get enough vitamin D is to supplement. For those of you that are lucky enough to live in a nice sunny state, go spend some time outside in the day, about 10 to 15 minutes, and your body's going to produce quite enough vitamin D to sustain you. And vitamin D, remember, it's fat soluble, so we actually can store it. Okay, moving on to metabolism. So we get a lot of questions about this, and this is probably one of the most hotly debated nutrition topics. It is all surrounded around metabolism. First of all, what is it? It's the rate at which the body converts food to be used as energy. So our goal is to have a fast and active metabolism. Who doesn't want that, right? How do you do that? You've got to fuel your body regularly throughout the day. So there's a lot of research that's kind of confusing around intermittent fasting right now. Um, and that involves kind of not really fueling your body regularly throughout the day. Important to note, all that research that's actually kind of what we call high quality um, is done in, in animals. So there's very, very little high quality research done in humans. Um, so that's kind of my little spiel on intermittent fasting. We recommend that people eat every three to four hours, and we'll get to what to eat in a second here. Breakfast, super, super key meal. I'm a big fan of it. It really, at its core, is us breaking the fast of sleeping. Um, it's really important to support a healthy metabolism. So again, that hype around intermittent fasting often means we skip breakfast. We don't really have enough research to support that that actually leads to longevity or healthier life. Um, it might work for some, but it's just, this is something that I usually approach in a one-on-one -on -one session. But um, after sleeping all night, right, we wake up, it's important to re-energize ourselves to start the day. So giving yourself breakfast gives you kind of the best footing 
Um, and research shows that those that eat breakfast daily have increase in cognitive function, have better memory and better problem solving skills. So that means you have increased energy, you may perform better at work or in school. Another thing about breakfast is we see that people that eat a balanced breakfast, so include carbohydrates, protein, and fat, um, tend to have less overeating later in the day. So you start your day off on a really good footing metabolically, and you start your, what that means is your blood sugar is stable to start the day. Um, and this means that we're less likely to be ravenous later in the day. We've all experienced that ravenous hunger and really like when you get to that point, it's really hard to make an informed choice. You just want whatever's most convenient and usually what's most convenient is not always the healthiest. Um, so that's why big fans of eating breakfast helps to stabilize your blood sugar, promotes that fast and active metabolism. So I've given you guys a lot of information. You're probably wondering, okay, how do I like apply this to my, my personal life? So we want to include all the macronutrients in all meals. And then you want to pick about two of them for each. Um, a good kind of meal structure, this is not like a rule or something that is an end all be all, but a good structure to kind of have in mind is aiming for half of your plate to be color, that's fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate to be carbohydrate, and a quarter of your plate to be coming from protein. Now, this can look <clears throat> many, many different ways. This is the super any sodas. So, we may have our color be coming from some fruits and some vegetables, like in that first photo up there. Maybe we're just loaded up on the veggies, um, or maybe you're eating a meal that doesn't make sense to portion out in this way, like a stir fry or a bowl. When that happens, I typically just say, be sure to aim for a lot of color um, and different color variety as well. It's important that meals are satisfying, right? Like, so yes, we want to be having all of these nutrients in there, but we also want the food to taste good. Um, so this is something I always encourage people is be sure that, you know, you're having things that you enjoy and that are what we call um, have the yum factor. We also want to start with the lasting energy. That's kind of the goal from eating. Um, and we refer to that as the time. So we're going to dive a little bit into some more science here. What we have here are the different macronutrients and then your blood sugar when you consume them. So you can see that eating carbs alone creates that big spike in your blood sugar. And then there's going to be a significant drop. And what that significant drop is, is it's that your body has released insulin. If you guys maybe remember from school, insulin is the key that lets your sugar into your cells. So you have this big spike of, of uh, blood sugar at around one hour after eating. Your body sends out a ton of insulin and then boom, you have a big drop in blood sugar. In that drop, people do not feel good. They feel hangry, tired, grumpy. Um, we have brain fog, dizzy, maybe you have a headache. So we want to avoid that. You can see that with protein and fat, the picture is much more stable. So you have a much um, more kind of steady rise in blood sugar and a much more steady fall. Now translating this into an actual meal, right? On the red bar, if you guys can see it, We've got a fat-free meal, so it's fat-free yogurt, apple, and a granola bar. So I would kind of label that as a higher carb, lower fat protein breakfast. And then the green bar, we've got full fat yogurt with some cream, some berries, and some nuts. So it's kind of like a fun little yogurt breakfast. Um, you'll see the sugar response is much different. So in the red bar, we get a lot of energy around one hour after we eat, and then boom, our energy crashes. And it's that crash where you're feeling actually kind of hungry and grumpy and just overall not good. Versus if you look down at the green bar, much more steady, slow rise, and you actually hit your peak energy um, about three hours after you eat it. And that's because the fats and the protein from the yogurt and from the cream and from the nuts is helping your body to really, really slowly and steadily release the sugar from the beans. So that's why we say um, balanced meals mean pairing carbs, protein, and fat, um, and cleaning those together. So another fun way to remember it um, that our other dietitian Crystal loves to say is carbs always have to have a buddy, and this is exactly why. Here's just a really brief list of some examples, um, and I'm going to provide you guys with more examples <coughs> in future slides and then in a handout, but. Um, you can pair some protein balls with fruit. So you can take some turkey, it's going to give you protein, some avocado to give you fat, and then some crackers to give you carbs. 
there's many, many ways to enjoy all the foods, right? So uh, zucchini and banana muffin, put a little bit of on there and you've got a really nice pairing that's gonna give you nice long lasting energy. If you eat any one of these, your blood sugar is probably gonna look a lot more like that green bar. It's gonna be a lot more stable. Okay, now I'm gonna check time here, we're good. And getting to the fun part. So fueling for adventure. This slide might be a little uh, technical, and I understand that not everybody's used to looking at stuff like this, but I wanted to give you guys some background um, into why we fuel with certain foods before we kind of get into what those foods are. So for those of you that are familiar, VO2 max can be thought of as just exercise intensity. So we've got 25%, which is really low intensity, and then 65 to 85. 85 being like a really high effort workout, 25 being like a nice jog or a really nice walk or a slow leisurely hike. Um, 85 would be like you're climbing Mount Rainier. Um, muscle glycogen, remember that's our stored carbohydrate. It's our kind of best friend. Muscle TG means muscle triglyceride. And we actually store fat in our muscle. That's a good thing. We use that as energy. Plasma SFA means plasma free fatty acids. That's just the fat that's circulating in our body. And then plasma glucose is sugar or glucose circulating in our body. So you can see that by far, carbs are your primary fuel source for moderate or high intense activity. Um, so if you look a little closer, you'll see that muscle glycogen, liver glycogen, and then our blood glucose are providing half the energy for moderate intensity exercise. So that could be like a marathon for some, um, or a half marathon, that could be like a um, workout class. Um, so half of your energy during that is coming from carbs. When you get higher in intensity, even more of your energy is coming from carbs. So this is why we say it's super important to fuel with carbs because they play such a strong role. Um, but it's also why fat has a role. Um, and so at that lower intensity exercise, as you can see, if you're just doing a nice leisurely stroll or just something that's you know active, but you're not out of breath, you're primarily using fat in those situations. So just to recap, we need fuel because I mean, human bodies are not as simple as cars, but in a way, like we're like cars. We need gas in our tank. Fuel helps us to build muscle and helps us to prevent our muscles breaking down. Overall, this means it helps us with recovery and it helps to prevent injury. So here are some ideas and we're gonna get into the nitty gritty here. Before you set off for your hike or your ski, your you know, snowboarding or your cross country ski and thinking of all these winter sports, um, you want to have high carb snacks for fuel. So aim for about 30 to 60 grams. And I'm going to give you guys some ideas of what that is. Um, so things like a bagel or a couple pieces of toast, some fruit, or a nice bowl of oatmeal. That's going to be about 30 grams of carbs. And then you want a really small amount of protein to help get your muscles <laughs> primed to build and prepare as you're going. Um, so about five to 10 grams. So that could be like an egg. It could be a handful of nuts or a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter, some good examples there. And I'll give you guys some meal examples later. How soon should you eat before? This is a really tricky one. Everyone's different. Everybody has different digestion. It's all about experimenting. If you have questions about this, happy to answer those. Um, a good starting point is to give yourself about 30 or 60 minutes before you do any activity to let yourself digest um, and then kind of adjust from there. So again, here's what I'm referring to, some kind of practical examples. And these are all examples of what 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates could look like. You see there's a lot of simple carbs on here. So white bread, fruit juice, pretzels. That's because your body can use these really, really well um, and really efficiently. If you were to try and, you know, have a, um, like a nice, really like Dave's killer whole grain bread sandwich right before a run or right before a hike, um, Chances are, if you don't give yourself enough time, you might not digest it quick enough. And then that food is just hanging around your stomach and it's not really available for your body to eat. During your adventure, it's all about carbs really. So simple, rapidly digesting carbs. You still wanna have some protein to help your kind of muscles. 
Um, and then for anything longer than four hours, definitely you want to have fat. So if you're going to be doing really long hikes this fall, it's beautiful outside. Um, anything longer than four hours, and I would say to bring some nuts or some peanut butter um, or some cheese, something that's going to give you some of that nice fat. Something with coconut oil is another good example. Here's some examples. So a simple carb, go-go squeeze. Peanut butter pretzels are one of my favorites. Um, this dried cheese is really nice. And then kale makes this kind of an obvious one. How often to fuel depends on the time of the activity. So for anything less than 45 minutes, you really don't need a lot. For anything in that, you know, one to two hours, you're going to want to give yourself a little dose of carb each hour. Um, for anything in between two and four hours, you want to give yourself a little bit more. So again, that 30 grams is kind of the sweet spot to start at about every hour. And then a small dose of protein every hour. Um, and then for anything longer than four hours, again, it's about frequent fueling um, with carbs and protein, and then a small amount of fat. There's no official amount of fat, I should say, to have during because everybody is a little bit different. Um, so this is something that, you know, in one-on-one -on -one sessions, we'll kind of come up with different examples of things to fuel with, and then I send you off, you see how it goes, and you report back. So typically I would do is think about what are the basic carbs um, and then what are some protein sources to pair it with. And you'll notice that a lot of these protein sources also have fat. So after your adventure, here are the important things to remember. The three R's of recovery, is what we like to call them. You gotta refuel, that happens with carbs. You gotta repair, that happens with protein. And you have to rehydrate, that's gonna happen with fluid and electrolytes. So we want to refuel with carbohydrates. Again, you're seeing a theme here. It's about 30 grams minimum. You can do, at this point, there's not really a difference between simple or complex because you're, you're kind of done with your activity and you're maybe just going to be hanging out on the couch or maybe you're going to be sitting in a car ride heading home from a hike. So you can do like a go-go squeeze, which is like an applesauce. You could do a juice or you could do, you know, a whole fruit. You want to repair it protein, about 10 grams minimum. Um, typically, a straight cheese is like 8 to 10 grams, so that's kind of a good one to bring along. A handful of nuts is usually about 5 grams. You'd want to do a couple of of those. And then rehydrate. That happens with food and electrolytes. So you can do water, but if you're going to do water, you've got to put either some electrolytes in it, or you want to have it with some salt um, and some potassium food. So some fruit or some nuts, um, and then get some nice salty nuts to kind of help with that uh, rehydration. You can do Gatorade, Powerade, sports drinks, chocolate milk is one of my favorites. Uh, coconut water is also super popular. And tart cherry juice is actually a great one. Um, remembering back to the piece where I talked about the pigments being nutrients, um, tart cherries are a great source of anthocyanins, which are those nutrients that are going to help your body fight inflammation. So a lot of the athletes that I work with, <laughs> I have them drink about four to eight ounces of tart cherry juice a day especially during their season. So if they're snowboarders or skiers or they play track and field or soccer, um, in season, I ask them to do that because it helps decrease soreness and helps their body kind of function better. Here's some more ideas. And again, you'll have all these handouts um, and the handouts have the guidelines on there. So I'm really excited But you can see just some practical ideas of things you could refuel with. I want to wrap up here um, with a little piece about mindfulness. So I've got this quote here, um, and I'm not going to read it. I'll kind of let you guys have it and let you sit with it. But um, it's from Center for Mindful Eating, and they really do a lot to promote mindfulness, which means removing distractions, right? There's so much going on in the world, um, and even like in our households. We've got our cell phones, kids are scrolling Instagram and Facebook. Maybe you're working on work emails, um, there's TV on, the radio's on, it's a lot going on. And it doesn't really always give us the opportunity to sit and really notice, like, do we like what we're eating? Am I full? Am I still hungry? Do I not like what I'm eating? What do I like about this? Um, and so when we're more mindful, it really allows us a chance to connect. Practically, it takes us about 20 minutes for our blood glucose levels to rise once we're done eating. Um, and so what that means is it, it can take about 20 minutes for us to realize that we're full. So for those of us that are like eating at our work desk and we're like scarfing down our food, which is admittedly sometimes me, um, 
I'm not really giving myself the opportunity to tune in to whether I'm full, whether I'm so hungry, or whether I even like what I'm eating. So I really encourage everybody, not every meal, because that's not practical and I'm a realist, but try it out with your family or your friends or even just yourself. Try having one mindful meal a day, um, or maybe even one a week. And that means one meal with very, very few distractions and see what happens. <laughs> Some of you might have heard of storm intuitive eating. This is also something that I could go on and on about. Um, and I included this in this presentation because it's a holistic focus. And um, in my mind, intuitive eating is 100% a holistic way to approach food. So for those of you that aren't familiar, what it is, is it's a dy dynamic approach to nutrition, basically rejects kind of any thoughts around diets, rejects food rules, and allows us to focus in on our own hunger and fullness and ultimately decrease stress around food. So we do this a lot in sessions with clients um, and I encourage you, if you've got any food rules, examine them um, and see if there's a way that you can reframe them or see if those food rules are practically serving you. Certainly there are some that are important to follow. So if you can't tolerate dairy, you know, that's a rule that you may want to follow. Um, but there may be some that we could kind of mix. So one example of this one, I've got rules about what time of day it's okay to eat. What we kind of think of this as or reframe it is that hunger is a sign that your body's working properly. So you're just honor it no matter what time of day. Another way to think of this is like, we all have the urge to pee, right? Nobody like has to pee and says like, oh shoot, I, I can't pee until 5 p.m. because I, I just peed, so I got to sit here and wait. Nobody does that. Hunger is the same thing. When we get hungry, that's a body, your body's sign that's telling you, hey, feed me, I need nourishment. The best thing you can do is to kind of meet that need. Another rule is super common is we hear ourselves saying, oh, I'm having pizza tonight, so I'm going to save up and I'm only going to eat, you know, small things throughout the day. Or I'm going out to my birthday dinner and I want to splurge, so I'm not going to eat breakfast. Um, in reality, um, by actually eating balanced meals and really following our normal timeline, we can go into that night excited, but not super ravenous. And that then means we're less likely to overeat. So really intuitive eating is kind of focused on reducing what some of you may experience um, is we call it the restrict binge cycle. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm sure that a lot of us have had this happen where we're like craving something, maybe it's Halloween right now, so Halloween candy. But we tell ourselves, no, I'm not going to have it. I'm just going to go have like carrots and hummus. Nothing wrong with carrots and hummus is great. But sometimes what then happens is we end up having the carrots and hummus. And then later on in the night, maybe we're relaxed, maybe we're stressed. And then out comes the Halloween candy. And we eat way more of it than we ever want to have. We just have the piece that we want to start with. Um, another thing is that's kind of a principle in intuitive eating and just a principle overall it's good to think about is removing shame and guilt around food. So when we, you know, are feeling shame or when we are feeling guilt, when we feel like we're being bad and breaking a rule, a lot of times the picture looks like this fry situation on the left, right? But when we say, hey, I want to have some fries, I'm not going to feel guilty about it. Like they just sound good and maybe I just finished a hike or you know, maybe I, I just, I'm at, at the ski lodge, I want to have this. When we allow ourselves to do that, it's much easier to stop it with that one. Um, so bringing it back here, some habits that I've noticed um, that create balance in life and that create lasting energy. And these are also habits that we've studied through research lines and we've known to be beneficial. Don't restrict food groups unless you have to. So certainly if you're allergic to gluten, please don't eat it. If you're allergic to peanuts, don't eat them. But don't restrict food groups as much as you can. Um, don't skip meals, so eat regularly. Eat a variety of foods and eat them consistently throughout the day. So allow yourself, think of yourself like you're building a fire. Whenever you're at a campsite and you're building a fire, the fire stays much stronger when you throw little kindlings in it, right? It doesn't do us any good to let the fire go out and then put a bunch of wood in. Let it go out, put a bunch of it. Um, so think of your body like that. Feed it regularly. Allow yourself to eat your treats and do so mindfully. Um, and then move your body in ways you enjoy. So I'm sure that you guys have a lot of resources at that for, um, for that at She Jumps in terms of how do we enjoy moving our bodies. Um, I know we experience momentum do. So really kind of wrapping it all up, health and wellness means so many things. I think it's really easy to think oh, health and wellness means I eat right and I exercise every day and I get good sleep. 
Well, there's a lot more to the picture, right? Um, yes, food is a factor. Yes, movement is a factor, but we have to think about mental health. We have to think about relationships, right? It's really important that we have free time and that we have hobbies. Another thing that I'm sure you guys really encourage us to get some nice outdoor hobbies. So that kind of wraps up my little educational portion. I'm gonna take some questions here in a sec, but before I get to that, I wanna tell you guys a little bit, about, a little bit, excuse me, about us at Experience Momentum. So we are an integrated wellness clinic. We've got many, many offerings. Um, as you can see on this slide here, we've got fitness and personal training. We've got a lot of class memberships, we've got classes, we do a variety of different workouts. Um, and we also, for those of you that are living in California or elsewhere, we do have virtual options. So we've got a fantastic virtual platform where you can access yoga, um, CrossFit classes, and even, you know, break down movements on how to lift weights. It's a really great resource. Of course, we have nutrition. So we do telehealth virtual appointments. Um, and we also do in-person appointments. We do grocery store tours. We do sports nutrition focused talks. So we'll go speak at teams. Um, or at summer camps and talk about, you know, nutrition to fuel, whatever activity. And then we also have some pre-recorded videos on our websites. Um, and we do take insurance, all of us kind of, so physical therapists, massage and nutrition. And nutrition, we can take insurance out of California. So that uh, our states have reciprocity that allows us to still see you, even though you live afar. Um, we've got physical therapy, so they do many, many things, um, and they also have a fantastic website with um, a lot of online videos and resources. And then we've got massage, which is probably the only one that you can't get virtually, so you got to be in person for that, but we do have offerings there. We're a 1% for the planet company, which means that we donate 1% of all our pre-tax revenue back to the environment. We absolutely love our earth, and we really believe that we should do everything we can to support it. And we're also a certified B Corporation. Um, and that means that we pay particular attention to our social impacts as well as our environmental impacts. So we really, um, we want to do our best to support our community and give back to our community. And we believe that these are two great ways to do that. And then here's our location. So we've got uh, one location up in Linwood, right by um, kind of, I guess, kind of near the Alderwood Mall, right up the way. And then we've got our other location where I primarily work. That's in lovely Fremont in Seattle. And then you could also catch us virtually. And I'll be distributing lots of um, materials and kind of information for you guys to be able to access those. So I'm ready to take questions. Um, and just so everybody knows, that's our email. If you would like to schedule, we, uh, we do free 15 minute assessments. So that means you schedule one of those, you'll get a call, um, a virtual or in person um, from one of our dietitians. And we'll talk to you about your goals, what you're looking for, and how we can help. And that's always uh, that free 15 minute availability that we have. So, with that said, I'm going to kind of stop talking and let you guys ask questions if there's anything you're curious to know more about. <laughs> Awesome, Nicole. Just a reminder, everyone, if you want to type those questions that you have into the QA section, the first question is from Brooke What does it mean when your metabolism slows down when you get older? It, is this common in your 20s to 30s? That's a great question, Brooke. And that's at, like, funny you bring that up because there's new research to show that partially our metabolism actually does not get slower. Um, so what happens as we age is our muscle mass declines. Um, and in part, our muscle, think of your body's muscle as your most metabolically active tissue. So the more muscle we have, um, the, the more energy you burn and we can think of that in calories. Um, so it's less about like anything to do with specifically with metabolism and more about as we lose muscle mass, which happens as we age, um, that's what kind of slows things down a little bit. So the thing you guys can do and we can all do to counterbalance that is keep fit, keep active, keep moving your body. Um, and absolutely no, do not worry about your metabolism slowing down in your twenties or thirties. Um, that is young in my book. So nothing to worry about there. That was the only question in the Q&A. Again, if anyone else has, oh, no, we've got another one. <laughs> Excuse right. me. When I am hiking or in the moment on adventures, sometimes I find that I forget about food because I am such a groove. Any tips? 
That's a really great question. Um, so um, a couple things that you can do. This, you probably aren't gonna wanna do this when you're out on the, out on the trail, but I do have some people set little reminders on their phones um, just to check in with themselves. So that is one thing you can do. If you're hiking with a buddy, I always encourage a buddy system when it comes to fueling. So I encourage you to check in with each other and say, you know, let's take a break, have a snack. Um, and then I also encourage just like frequent water breaks, frequent times, like we can be in the moment 100% um, and be, you know, appreciating all the nature that we're seeing. That actually does give us a time to kind of stop and have a mind stop. Sometimes what really helps too is setting a little bit of a goal. Um, so setting a goal of like, I want to have three mindful moments on this hike. And then at each mindful moment, it's an opportunity to check in with yourself. It does not mean that you have to eat, um, but it means that you can kind of say, hey, am I, am I hungry right now or do I want to wait? Um, and I will say, we say you want to be having that about every hour. Um, and everybody's different. So um, men typically have more muscle mass than women, which means that they have more glycogen. So they can get away with a little bit longer periods in between those snacks. Um, so that's, that's one advantage, I guess you could say, but it is really individual. And I'll, I'll say too, a big sign is if you're getting fatigued or you feel like dizzy or you just start feeling, um, you know, that what the feeling is kind of like hitting a wall. Like you just, your legs feel a little bit lead. That's a big sign. So sometimes it's less about reminders and more about like just tuning into your body and what's going on. If that didn't answer your question, feel free to send an email and I'm happy to kind of help more. Next question from Anonymous. What if I don't like drinking water? Is there something I can drink instead? That's a big one. Um, and <laughs> some questions I ask is, typically like why? So some of us just get bored of the flavor, right? Like water is kind of bland. Um, and so some things to make it fun would be uh, adding frozen fruit to it. You can also buy, there's a product called Neo and there's some similar ones out there. And it's a little like packet that you, it's a flavor packet that you squeeze into your water. Um, and so those are some tips to kind of make water more flavorful and fun. You can also drop like a noon tablet or an electrolyte tablet in there to give it some flavor. But ultimately, we can't get really around like the drinking water thing. Yes, there's water in juice, there's water in milk, there's water in food. So there's water obviously in things like watermelon, but there's also a little bit of water in all fruits and vegetables. So the more you use of those, the better. But ultimately, water is one of those that we kind of just gotta, gotta be part of our life. Um, but you can spice it up or flavor them with lemons or fruit. Yes, I, I, I can see the questions now. So do you have any good recipes to make for fuel on the go for my next adventure? That was the next question. I have lots of good recipes. I'm gonna make a note of that and I'm gonna include a little packet um, of some really fun, um, energy balls, energy bars, and these are all things that you can make with oats, um, with nut butter, dates. If you guys do like dates, dates are another really good thing that you can um, bring on hikes. And they're fun. You can just kind of like slice it open, put a little peanut butter in there, and then maybe roll it in coconuts or chocolate if you want. That's another fun snack. But I will include a list of snacks for fuel on the go. Last call for questions then. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as you know, Cole mentioned, you will be able to uh, receive all of this recording along with all the assets that she's mentioned throughout uh, in our follow-up email. And you can get in contact with Nicole uh, directly at Experience Momentum as well. So Nicole, thank you so much for sharing all of your information tonight. It was so helpful <laughs> and so informative. You are welcome. You are welcome. Awesome. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone. You have a good night. Bye. Thank you.